Welcome to ATS Decides Austin's Next Mayor. I'm Santa Henderson, and I'll be moderating today's discussion on behalf of Austin PBS. So thank you so much for joining us. Now, on November 8th, voters went to the polls to elect an Austin mayor. Out of six candidates, none of those received 50% of the vote. Therefore, we have the two top candidates here with us today, and they're having a runoff election. So we want to welcome Representative Celia Cruz and uh, Senator Kirk Watson. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll have some questions for you today, and they're from the public. These questions are from community members. They have concerns about things going on in Austin. So what we'd like for you to do is have a very conversational approach and give each other time, be respectful to answer these questions and have responses if necessary. So let's get right to it. The first question topic in Austin we're going to talk about is affordability. As you know, on the minds of many, Austin is considered a very desirable place to live, but it's also con so considered one of the most expensive places to live. Many people talk about police, EMS, firefighters, those who protect a community can't even live within the city limits because of the high cost of living. So if you're elected as mayor, what would you do? What initiatives would you bring forth to help make this city more affordable? And we'll begin with Senator Watson. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thank PBS for doing this. Thanks for all the people that are here and all the people that are watching. Uh, look, there's no question that we are in a cost of living emergency in this town. And affordability is the word, the, the buzzword that gets used all the time, but it's a meaningful word because we're talking about whether or not people can afford to live here. Uh, there are, I, my plan is to approach it from a, a couple of different ways. Obviously, first and foremost, we have to address housing and we have to get past the stalemate that we have been in for the last eight years to a decade in terms of being able to move forward and get more housing on the ground. That's going to require a number of things. One is it's going to require cleaning up and, and fixing our development serv the services department so that people can get permits and move more quickly. It's going to require that we uh, work with the land development code and make changes in the land development code. So there's a lot of work that needs to go in that, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. There's two other things that I think we ought to be addressing, and one is, and I've talked about this frequently on the trail, and that is daycare and the ability to get affordable daycare. That's typically the second largest expense in many households, and it's not equitable in Austin, Texas. And then the third thing is I think we need to be changing the way we approach economic development, uh, typically we just count the number of new jobs we created and say that's a good thing, but I think we need to focus on Austinites and getting Austinites into those new jobs that we're creating so that they'll have more income and be able to afford more. Representative Israel. Um, affordability and housing is the, is the singular reason why I'm running. As, um, as someone who came here in 1982, who was able to work her way through college by delivering pizzas and living at a mobile home park. I know those days are long gone, but I, I believe strongly that the, the housing crisis that we're in is brought on by ourselves. This is a housing supply. I'm a pro-housing candidate and I will be a pro-housing mayor. And I'm not content with the fact that the, the, those who take care of our children and take care of our loved ones uh, in the heart of the city their only recourse is to go home at night to Bastrop or Elgin. This is a progressive city with a big heart. So um, I'm the only person in this race with what I call a bold and progressive plan to say that what was, um, what was a school, what was a storage facility for Austin Energy, what was a, um, a 1980s commercial office park, we've got to rethink it. Those office buildings aren't full anymore. In the midst of the pandemic, we have discovered how to work and move around in different ways. So I want to make sure that I am speaking on behalf of those individuals. Um, I've made, I've talked about my personal story in that my, my, my wife and I um, have been renters and we understand what it's like to get that note from the property management company that take it or leave it, three hundred more dollar a month increase. I, I believe as a working class chick that I am more connected to those who are, who are having these issues at this moment in time. So 
my, my policies reflect that, and um, I'm moving urgently because I know that people are hurting. Thank you. So both of you keep that thought in mind because we'll revisit uh, some of this question. Our next topic came up multiple times from our community <coughs> members, and that is about zoning. We have four questions, and I'll read each of those to you to get <laughs> some answers. Question one is from David Piper. How, and David emphasizes how, would you change zoning in single family areas to slow the replacement of small houses with McMansions? David says, please don't give the simple answer of, I will work to change zoning that yields affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Representative Israel. It's a great question. I'm, I'm the only candidate in this race with a lived experience that I know what it's like to, the, I can build a house. I, I know what it's like to be in that development services department at 7.30 in the morning and waiting for that permit. Um, what's built into my policies are things that would encourage aging in place. For example, uh, uh, for those who want to, if you're gonna preserve the house and you wanna build a duplex in the back, there's a way for us to say, we'll give you more buildable area. So it's, uh, it's a preservation bonus. So these discussions have been in the works for, for months. Um, my goal is that we not take more months to finalize it, but to, to say you can age in place and here's, here's a process and a way for you to do it. Uh, that's, that's one item. We have to, in the, in the era of implementation of Project Connect, as a, as a strong advocate for mass transit, we can't, we, we, every time you build a house, the city says you have to design for two cars. I, I think that's a really backwards way of looking at it. The state of California eliminated those parking requirements completely. We know that's not gonna happen in Texas, but where, where Project Connect is coming through, uh, to, to encourage more, we need de density equals better use of our transit system is what I'm trying to say. So we should be able to eliminate or limit those parking requirements so that you're not designing for cars, but you're instead designing, de you're designing for people. I, I say that as a realtor, I know that my clients, especially the younger folks who are moving here, um, they, they want maybe one car and a set of scooters. They want, they want options. And, and where they live, and I want them to live in the heart of the city, not in the edge of the city. Senator Watson. Sure, the question was about what would you do zoning-wise for single-family houses so that uh, more could, you could have greater density and greater housing uh, from a zoning perspective. And, and first and foremost, what you need to do is you need to have a zoning change, a specific zoning change, so that on a single-family lot, it doesn't stay sing single-family if you want to for example, knock down the house that was there and build something else. Typically what happens is uh, the house gets knocked down, it gets demolished and then, uh, and it was more affordable, it was, it was smaller, but it was more affordable. And then a McMansion, a single family uh, big house gets built. The zoning change can, can be done in such a way that it would also allow for someone to build a duplex, a triplex or a fourplex. And by doing that, you get more and additional uh, housing, uh, the, to be specific with the, the answer. And it's true that you're going to need to do something in addition with regard to parking and, and, and reducing some parking requirements, but that could go along with your, your attempted z your zoning change. One other thing that I'd say about that is a zoning change that also allows for there to be easier building of accessory dwelling units so that people can come in and build that accessory dwelling unit, again, have greater density in terms of housing, and in many instances, probably make it easier for someone to stay in the, the house because now they have some additional income from a, a rental property, or they can move in family, and it saves money for the family in some way. But those are two specific things with regard to, to zoning on single-family homes. Santa, let me uh, emphasize, this is all in my, in my policies that I in introduced in June. We launched our campaign in January. I think it's important to mention that um, as part of my journey to be, to say I'm, I'm gonna run for mayor was the realization that the city had programs and thought we were doing good things. Affordability unlocked is an example of it. So it would say to someone, if you're gonna build a uh, a sixplex or a couple of fourplexes on an acre of land. I, I, I was helping my sister sell her acre and this is when I had my, my aha moment. The, 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 the buyer said, I would love to, to do the affordability unlocked program, but it's gonna take me a year just to get my site plan approved. 
And, and I said, well, tell me more. And he said, well, if I keep some of these d units at a more affordable rate, the city will help me with my utility costs. And I said, so it's un it doesn't really unlock anything. And he said, well, the, the utility cost, yes, but it still takes me a year to get the site plan approved. So my proposal is that if, something, if someone comes through and wants to do something creative with the, with, the, with the space and build more homes instead of a big house, then that moves to the front of the line. This is, this is an urgent, critical time for the city, and this is, this, is, this is why I'm running, and this is what my policies reflect. Senator Watson, if you'd like to reply to that. Sure. Um, I, I tried to answer the question specifically, but let's talk a little bit more about broader plans. Um, first of all, we agree that the Development Services Department has to be revamped. Uh, what I put out in terms of a proposal is uh, to follow the nationally recognized model of uh, the Sunset Commission in the state of Texas. I served on the Sunset Commission uh, for many years, and what we need to do is we, you know, Everybody has a different idea about what would make it better. We need, to, we need to put it all together and make it better, and the way to do that is by a top to bottom, uh, quick review of it, best practices and, uh, and efficiencies, and then implement those, because it is correct. It should not take the length of time. In addition, there are some things that ought to move to the front of the line. What I've laid out is a proposal uh, it, or a couple of things, including something as simple as what I call uh, pop-up permitting, where some permit, we, we have on se separate days, permits for, let's say, residential uh, fixes that need to happen so that they can be done quickly and efficiently, and then they're not standing in line, nor are they in line, and they're blocking somebody else in line. And another thing that I've laid out is that we need to, um, we need to look at the fees we're charging because those fees are blocking the ability to build affordable housing. And I've said that one of the things that I would like to see us do is um, reduce those fees, eliminate uh, you know, up to 50% of those fees to make sure on, on the types of things that we want to see built, things like more housing, uh, so that we can move all of those things faster and cheaper so that it passes on to more affordable housing. Okay, we're gonna move on just a second, but okay. we have a couple of more questions about zoning, so we can tell you guys are ready for those. The next question is about zoning restrictions and how they are applied. Tom Smith says, neighborhoods typically have declaration of co conditions, covenants, and restrictions that are attached to lots. Citywide rezoning eliminates single family residential conflicts with this. Can affordability be met by more selective rezoning? And one another community member asks, do you believe that all zoning and growth issues are uniform across the city? Will you support and resume small area neighborhood planning as requested by some currently serving zoning commissioners? Senator Watson. Sure. One of the reasons we're so frustrated with this issue and the fact that we've made so little progress on it is because of the way it was approached. And it was approached as an all-or-nothing approach. Code Next was an all-or-nothing approach. You had to do it all across the city this way, and, or you ended up with nothing, even to the point of trying to get around certain protections and certain rights uh, of landowners, and the court said, city, you can't do that. One of the ways to address that is to have an, a baseline throughout the city, which we really do. Uh, we have a baseline for what affordable housing ought to uh, be in district by district, with a focus on district, and a recognition that we have a single member district system that was created so that neighborhoods and communities of interest could express what their desires were. What I have argued for is allow those districts, those neighborhoods, to come forward and say, here's what we want, and then implement those things. You would avoid, by the way, then, the, the valid petition issues that happened with uh, Code Next, and you would, could incentivize that, and my plan specifically incentivizes it, by saying that if some district is doing more or doing it faster, then they would be able to keep more of the tax base that is created as part of that. And they could use that for anti-displacement, rental assistance, those sorts of things. But the question is, is really important because for us to achieve this goal, we're going to need to listen to the people. 
and they're going to be able to tell us where greater density can be used. Now, I want to be clear, because it's my, my proposal has been mischaracterized. I want to be very clear. This is not so that any district can veto something. The districts have to meet a certain baseline, but they can help us work out where that density goes. They can help us work out how that density is there so that you get the results that you're looking for. No veto allowed in this because we need it everywhere. And the last thing I'll say is, and if we pass anything that's citywide, a change that is citywide, it applies citywide. If we're working on transit corridors, for example, and we say, here's what we're going to do, and we can talk about that some more but with my thoughts on that, that applies regardless of what I'm saying in terms of this, this sort of plan that comes forward from districts. Representative. Could you say the question again? Please? Sure. It's twofold. We're talking about rezoning, and they're talking about some neighborhoods have declaration of conditions, covenants, and restrictions that are attached to lots. Citywide rezoning eliminates single-family residential conflicts with this. Can affordability be met by more selective rezoning? Do you believe that all zoning and growth issues are uniform across the city? Will you support and resume small area neighborhood planning as requested by some currently serving zoning commissioners? Um, I'll give you an example of um, a situation in which I was having a, uh, in, in the Crestview neighborhood, I was having a neighborhood meeting, uh, meet and greet, and in Crestview, which is near the intersection of Lamar and Airport, is a train station and the number one bus that goes by with high frequency. That's our, that's our, that's our packed bus in the morning. Um, adjacent to that is a uh, several acre tract of land that was owned by Austin Energy. And the neighbors said, you know, this is, this is something that we want. We want to build community in a different way. And the city's been thinking about doing something there. And we pulled it up on the, on the, on the news uh, article about it. The city had been, has been thinking about doing something there for about 12 years. And by something, I mean homes. So while we, while we, while we cuss and discuss, as my dad would say, we, we, we lose opportunities to build homes. This is a neighborhood that wanted this place. This was, a, this was and could still be an opportunity for us to build row housing with a child care center on board, with a pocket park on board that is connected to the neighborhood. And the best, the best part, if we would eliminate those parking requirements, that could be a couple who lives in the heart of the city. Husband goes to work at Dell. The wife goes to work and takes the bus and goes downtown. This has got to be a part of our future. This is an urgent situation, Santa. We are losing our diversity. We're the, one of the only American cities that's losing our percentage of African Americans and Latinos. And it's because we don't do bold, creative, and visionary things. And I have those plans, and I'm eager to get started. We have a couple more questions about zoning, so we want to make sure we get the specificity. We're going to nerd out today. The members are asking. So the next one is, when we're talking about zoning, do you believe we need to protect our waterways and green space? If yes, please describe policy specifics that staffing zoning lawyers should expect. If no, describe how you would guarantee potable water supplies. Well, it's a, it's a valid question. With with the growth comes uh, impacts in other ways, and how our how is our water supply impacted? Um, so I I do support the uh, the the review. It's one of our in our twelve silos in which you have to go through to build something. You have to you have to get those reviews. My proposal, by the way, would be to have an ombudsman so that um, if you are building something and, and water is impacted and erosion is impacted and Austin Energy is involved and tree review is involved, that ombudsman can say, let's all come together and sort of be the referee. But there's no doubt water, water quality and retention are, are part of it. And especially uh, with climate change and, and us being prepared for uh, severe weather events. Senator Watson. I, I do favor that, that protection and uh, what the folks ought to expect is that we would convene we would convene so that we would get science based upon what it is we're going to do along those waterways and, and make it actually actually make scientific based determinations about what ought to happen. Um, I have a lot of experience with this in, in the sense that uh, when I was mayor the first time uh, from 97 to 2001 one of the things we did as part of water quality protection is we uh, we were able to set aside more preserved land than at any time in the history of Austin, and we were able to 
uh, make an arrangement where we uh, were able to preserve our water supply for decades. I don't mention that to talk about how good the past was, although it was pretty good. I mention it to say that there's experience here that gets brought to the job in a way where you have a proven record of success that will make a difference in the future um, in dealing with this type of specific issue. So Our, if, if the past was pretty good, we would be in a better, we would be better prepared for the growth that we've been experiencing. We would have had land, land banks. We would have had a lot of these zoning changes already done. I'm, I'm saying we don't have time for reviews and study and analysis. I'm not giving a seat up in the legislature to do more task forces and sunset reviews. I want to be respectful of our neighbors, but I also want to be respectful of those people who want to be our neighbors. Thank you. Last question about zoning comes from Michael Sullivan, who says, how would you vote on developing the plot of land on South Congress around the Austin American Statesman building? Oh, I, now that I, the process has been completed, I would have probably voted in the majority on that, uh, which just happened. I would have voted. I would have voted against it. <laughs> I, when when asked about affordability, that is a project by Endeavor, who developed the domain and did Saltillo, and they're getting three hundred million of our tax dollars in 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 the form of incentives. I want more. We're the sexy girl at the dance, guys. Everybody wants to be here. So why do we keep doing these deals? I don't understand. I would ask more questions. I would have higher expectations of us to say to Endeavor, we want, we want more. We want better. Um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a very unique tract of land. And I hope that our mayor and council will, will take a second look at it. I have a reputation in the legislature. I know that I don't have the ability to make anybody do anything. I don't get to be the queen of Austin as much as I would love to be the queen and say, make it so. But I get to ask questions. And I, and I think that this project deserves a lot more questions, especially with a company like Endeavor, whose PAC is given heavily to Kirk Watson's campaign. Thank you. Next topic we'll discuss is homelessness. <laughs> we'll discuss homelessness. Okay. We, we talked about affordability earlier. And we have a question from one community member who says, end the homeless issue. If you work on that issue, you'll solve others at the same time, such as mental and physical health, mm -hmm. skilled education, job training and job security, and poverty. To each of you, do you agree with this community member that providing housing will solve the other issues mentioned? Representative Israel. When I talk about our lack of housing supply, it's for all kinds of people in all kinds of places, whether you're a young developer at Facebook or whether you're one of our unhoused neighbors who has had several blows in life um, there, but for the grace of God to go any of us, and we should never, we should never forget that. But we need, we do need permanent supportive housing for unhoused neighbors, so that housing, the lack of housing supply, applies to to our unhoused neighbors as well. And um, it, when I talk about the permitting process and the site review process, it gets real wonky. But these people are hurting. These are our, these are our neighbors, whether they're unhoused or whether they're, they're working their way up through a career. It shouldn't take someone like Foundation Communities two years to get a site plan approved, but that's the way it works right now. We need to move urgency and move forward, and if, if your project is going to be doing something life-changing and impactful, like say to that unhoused person, we're gonna provide you a, a safe and a, and a dignified place to live with a social worker and a nurse, you get to the front of the line and it's not gonna take you two years to get a review done. Senator Watson. Yeah, we're going to have to have more housing. And, but, but again, the frustration, the inability to seem to be able to get anything done and move things forward has been in part because it feels like we as a community were given an all or nothing choice again, a zero sum game. Either camp anywhere you want to camp, any time of day with little responsibility or permanent supportive housing. And not everyone needs permanent supportive housing. We have to enforce the camping ban. The citizens have told us to enforce the camping ban. The state legislature has passed legislation, legislation mandating that we enforce the camping ban. But we're not prepared to enforce the camping ban. We need to have a continuum 
that addresses different needs for different people that find themselves on the cusp of living homeless or living homeless. And by the way, that's a, a key part of that, is we need to be doing more to prevent homelessness and people living homeless uh, than, than we're, we're currently doing. That continuum includes many of the things mentioned by the questioner that we're still not doing well. Uh, because, for example, uh, brain health is a, is a key part of that. We need to be addressing brain health more in that continuum. Um, I'm pleased that I was able to get uh, quite a bit done with regard to brain health uh, while I was in the legislature. That needs to be expanded now, and it needs to include things like therapeutic housing that would help, uh, would help us with the homeless situation. We need to have more... Um, uh, rapid housing for people that are on the cusp or have just become uh, living homeless and they if we could just get them rapid rehousing for a period of time they'll be back on their feet and they won't need permanent supportive housing so while I agree we need more housing we need we need to be working on this across the continuum and not just focus on an all-or-nothing answer if, if we've learned anything from other American cities who are dealing with this crisis as well, it is that we cannot get behind the issue. We've got to stay ahead of it. And that, that falls on the city and our responsibility. And where our heart is, we are a, we are a big-hearted city. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we are building these, this housing and these housing supports. But it's also a workforce issue, Santa. When you go to the, go to the integral care website and say, and look at their jobs, their job postings, they're looking for 50 caseworkers like right now. So these, these professionals are part of the equation. Thank you so much. So we're moving on to our next topic, and that is diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think you mentioned earlier that African Americans and Latinos are moving out of the city in droves. Many are citing affordable housing and lack of viable job opportunities. So if elected as mayor, what would you do to make this city a better place to live for everyone? Me first? Yes. Well, there are a couple of things that we need to, we need to address. Um, and I mentioned a couple of them in, in, I think, maybe my first answer. Because there's some systemic problems that, that are causing part of this. I, I mentioned child care. Uh, we need to have a, uh, the city needs to focus on child care as one of its big initiatives everywhere in the city. Because there's two, at least two, factors involved in that that structurally create problems for people of color that want to live in the city. One is that when you have inequity in terms of where people can get affordable, safe child care, then it makes a difference on the mom or dad, or many times the mom, uh, being able to work and be at work at different points in time. But the second thing that it does is it creates a structural inequity between those who can afford child care and get good early childhood development for their children and others that can't. And that disparity grows over time and that's a problem in Austin. The second thing that I'd bring up is the jobs that I mentioned. I want a jobs program that focuses on our youth in schools that say, we're gonna focus on you starting in the freshman year so that you, when you come out of high school, you already have a certificate or uh, you work with a trade union and you can go into an apprenticeship so that you walk into a sixty-five or seventy thousand dollar maybe you hunt with a six figure uh, in some instances position so that you can stay in austin and you know that austin's thinking about you and wants to help and then the last thing i'll mention there's others but i'll mention i'll mention a third and that is as we talk about affordability clearly we need to make housing more affordable so people can stay but one of the things that we've realized over time is that when you build affordable housing, some communities don't have the access to credit, they don't have the access to capital to take advantage of those affordable uh, houses. And, and the problem with that, of course, is a structural problem. So as we build out our affordability programs, one of the things we need to focus on is how we fix that so that people will be more able to stay. Santa, imagine, imagine if, imagine for a moment, all of the corporations that have been coming here over the, over the course of many, many decades now, imagine if there was a woman-led city who said to them, we're gonna do a deal with you, but we want a childcare center on site. 
it makes a difference that um, women and people of color are in positions of power. I'm looking forward to serving as your next mayor and asking those kind of questions for the future. Why isn't anybody asking that question of the statesman PUD right now? We could be doing some dramatic, life-changing things with our wealth, and our wealth is our, is our real estate, our wealth is our people, um, our wealth is that we are a trendy place to be, and people want to be here. So let's take advantage of that demand and turn it into something that is truly life-changing, like a child care center and like a, 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 a public health that is, that is thoughtful of the fact that we are moving people out instead of inviting them in. Thank you. We'll move on to our next topic, okay. and we want to remind you to be mindful of the time so that each of you can have a good responses. We're talking about safety in the downtown district. Uh, you, anytime you can watch the news, you'll see uh, <coughs> crimes, theft, drug yeah. sales. So people are concerned about downtown turning from a tourist attraction, a fun place, to a place where they feel threatened. So if elected as mayor, what would you do, Representative Israel, to ensure that the downtown district is returned to a safe state where people can enjoy it again? I'm the only candidate in this race with a stated policy position on public safety. And I know that when people hear about our uh, unhoused, whether they're downtown or Springdale Road, they, they, do, they, they, they do think about safety. And, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that. But many of these individuals are, are in a space in which they need health care. Uh, they don't, it's not a crime to not have a home. Uh, we have an example of, uh, of a, of a um, integral care facility off of Ben White that, that will take someone who's having a, a mental health crisis. That, that facility is full all the time. So my proposal and my, and my policy proposal, it is to have a, a stronger collaboration with the county on these integral care. In other words, that one facility is getting overrun. Uh, I've had the experience in, in, my, own, in my own life of, 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 uh, of seeing an unhoused person disrobing in my front yard. And I was just block walking yesterday. They were clearly having a mental health episode. I was just talking to someone yesterday. I was block walking uh, and they said, I'm so glad to see you. I just called um, uh, 911 because somebody in my front yard was having a mental health episode. And I said, well, tell me how it played out. And she said, well, I called the cops. Uh, I, got, I called 911 and I got relayed to mental health support. A mental health team and APD showed up immediately. That should work wherever you are. We need to feel safe. It's our number one job. So I, I fully support, uh, um, I understand the, 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 the situation downtown. I've worked downtown. Obviously, I have an office downtown for a few more weeks. But this is this is something that I'm mindful of, and it also so it speaks to our our social service supports with with mental health um, uh, collaboration, working with integral care in the county, and it ultimately also refers to the to the permanent supportive housing answers that we were talking about earlier in our conversation. Thank you. When it comes to public safety, um, I'm proud that I have been endorsed by public safety, public safety professionals in, in this race, including fire and the EMS associations. And, and I'll, I'll give two quick answers with regard to downtown. One is, yes, there needs to be uh, a better opportunity when someone that's in a crisis situation with mental health, brain health issues, uh, that where they can be taken quickly as opposed to just taken to jail or asked to move along where we can help and, and that will help with safety. But importantly, we have to fully staff the police department and we have to make sure that we have full staffing uh, so that response times are what we want them to be and there's the ability to, when needed, have concentrated uh, staffing in, in the downtown area from time to time. So that is one of the things and we can do that and have a just system of policing, but we're going to have to do that. And, and, and I will mention one other thing. Uh, when we talk about things like fire, that's a public safety, and I know the question t tended to be more, I think, related to crime, but the truth of the matter is, we have not done what we need to do in terms of you know, uh, ladder uh, equipment uh, for our fire department, and when you stop and think about it, I think the last ladder was bought in like 95, and think about the difference in terms of high rises and buildings in downtown. That is also a public safety issue that we're going to have to address. 
Thank you. So you touched on our next topic. We talked about drugs and crime. So we want to talk about those people on the front lines, and those are police officers, EMS, firefighters. Much has been said about the shortages that we have in Austin and the need to get more people. So the question is twofold. If elected, how would you address the staffing issue, and what would you do to ensure it stays where it needs to be to keep people safe? I'm first? Yes. Well, um, I just said it. We need to be fully staffed. Look. Everybody in Austin, Texas has the right to be safe and the right to feel safe. That includes whether you are uh, at two o'clock in the morning and you think somebody's breaking into your dwelling or you're a person of color that's sitting in a car being approached by police officers. No one should fear the police. Everyone should be safe and feel safe. We can have a very just system of policing in this town based upon our re recruitment, our training, our supervision, and making sure that we have a very transparent and effective accountability system. But that is not a binary choice with having full staffing. We need to get to full staffing. And the, the number one thing that we're gonna have to do to get to full, well, there are two things that are probably tied for number one. One is we gotta retain the folks that are there. So that means we have to be doing the things that will retain people that won't leave and drive us further down. But the second is we've got to get to a police contract. We have to get a contract to send the message that you can be recruited and have, uh, have a place in Austin, Texas, and of course, to keep people that are here. And then uh, fire and EMS are the same way, we, we, but, but what I'd say about that is, then we have to make it a priority and keep it a priority. It has to be among the very first things, if not the first thing, that we budget for in order to maintain the staffing levels. Santa, here's, I'm the only person in this race with a stated policy around public safety. I thought I just stated it. And in my policy, I have outlined several uh, priorities. And the opportunity for us to, uh, to come back from the pandemic is real. We lost police officers. We are not fully staffed. We need to be fully staffed. The number one job of the city is to keep you safe, regardless of zip code regardless of status in life. Um, we need to make sure that our police are fully, fully well compensated, the best trained in the country, um, and that have an oversight component. Cops want good cops on the street. I served on the police monitor board, uh, the first one, appointed by Gus Garcia, and I, under, and I understand that concept that if you wear the badge and this is your career, you are doing harm to your profession by not having an oversight component to hold our police accountable. I have a personal story to tell, and, and I feel like it's important to say it because I want people to know that when you call 911, you want the police to be there. As a child, I called the police several times on my dad, who was a, who was a mean drunk, and he beat up my mom. I had to call 911 and say, there, my dad is hurting my mom. Imagine being a nine-year-old kid and having to do that. It's real for me. I know what it means to say that the police were there for my family at different points, points in my life. But we have, to, we have to have high expectations of our police force as we make sure that they're fully compensated, fully staffed and supported, and have an oversight component. This, and policing and public safety in my, in my policy also includes something I've, I've spent my my legislative career on, and that is traffic safety. We've got to find a way to make sure that as we are fully staffing, people are driving too damn fast, and they're driving distracted, and we, and we are losing our neighbors on, on, on our roads. And there's, there's a role for policing in that as well. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. Uh, Senator Watson, you talked about no one should be afraid of police. You mentioned oversight. So let's talk about that in terms of uh, the perception of police in some communities, especially mm -hmm. marginalized communities. So what would you do to ensure people that we're getting police officers that are trained and that they can feel safe in Austin? How do you get rid of that stereotype of we're afraid of them? Well, I think first and foremost is you have to, as I said a minute ago, you have to have a transparent system. You have to have a transparent system that shows every step of it. Um, I mentioned recruitment, uh, training, and involve the community in helping you develop the, the training system so that it's not only transparent, but they're, they're, they're playing a role and feel invested in, in that. Supervision, 
uh, one of the things that uh, there's a, a, a model that's uh, being developed right now, and uh, it was shared with me, is that that if you have more police officers in supervisory roles at scenes of incidents, you have less showing of force. So that's one of those instances where it shows it's not a, a zero sum game or uh, all or nothing. And, and so make that transparent. And then of course the system has to work. Um, I'm pleased that I was the mayor that we created the first police monitor when I was mayor. Um, and, and we need to make sure that that is improved upon, grown, and that it actually works and, and people get to see it. You're never going to restore trust unless people see themselves in the situation and they see the system working. Thank you. My, my policy calls for the best trained police force possible. The reason we, we lost officers is two reasons. We didn't, we didn't have, we need a contract in place to reassure our police officers that we, we, we respect you and we need you on the job. Number two, we don't have, we need to make sure that our, our training, which was, is being retooled now and being tested, is continually retooled and retested. It is um, one of the things that, that concerns me the most about not being at full staffing levels is that we are losing senior police officers who have the guardian mentality as opposed to the warrior mentality. They, can, they, they have learned to interact with the community in a way that is safe, that is respectful, so that they get that respect in return. And I think that's really important. Thank you. So we're moving on to the next topic, and that is health care. We have a question from a community member. Nancy Traeger Neville says, what steps will you take to ensure a more equitable health care system? Does the city have the power and resources to have an impact on a very complex system? Representative Israel? We absolutely do. It's, it's a critical component of what we do, and it makes sure, make sure that we have regional uh, equity uh, as well. The pandemic revealed the inequities in our in our public health system. Being responsive to you, regardless of zip code, is is really important. You know, there was a map that struck that was very striking that I saw um, last year. When you looked at the, uh, this has to do with industrial development and us being more mindful of air quality as well. The num the the cases of asthma, childhood asthma, it, there's a huge demarcation between east and east of I-35. So it, it's, these are environmental impacts, it's air quality, and it's making sure that our resources are evenly distributed. This happens to be one of the passions of mine, which is healthcare, and part of that is because uh, it's personal with me, and um, I'm here uh, and haven't died because of early effective and frequent healthcare with some of my past history. And I believe that that's a right of everyone, is to have early effective and frequent healthcare. And that's one of the reasons you've seen me work so hard in this area. Uh, for example, in the work I put in to uh, get us the, the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas, to get us a modern 21st century safety net and teaching hospital, to do what I've done with mental health out at the Austin State Hospital. And the answer, the direct answer to your question is absolutely we have the ability to do that if you have uh, the will to do it and you push for it. I cannot imagine what this city would have been like, including from an equity standpoint, had we not had the medical school during the pandemic and the role that it played. So it has to be an intentional thing. Uh, we are far from where we need to be on equity, but we, and, and we saw it play out during the pandemic when people, uh, when we were trying to get people tested and we were trying to get people vaccinated, uh, we didn't look first to where it was going to be the hardest to provide those resources. And that should have been one of the first things we do, did. So yes, this is, a, this is something we have to address and we have to address better. Um, and I look forward to that opportunity. So I think it's worth mentioning that I'm the only candidate in this race with a stated policy around reproductive equity uh, and rights. Women, uh, women are in a very tenuous position right now. We are, we are being told by our government what we can and cannot do with our bodies. And we've never been in this spot before, never thought we'd, we would be. But we need to make sure, as, as stated in my policies, that uh, I will continue to support the GRACE Act and support those, those who need reproductive care should they have to go and will have to go now uh, to go to New Mexico or Colorado or another state that in, in which they can get the care that they need. I will have their back. 
And I, and I want to say that I support that, that act as well and uh, have been on the front line of uh, supporting and defending women's reproductive rights and abortion rights and, in fact, have been endorsed in this race by Senator Wendy Davis for the role that I've played in that. Um, that's one of those areas where I, I think you don't see much difference between the two candidates uh, because we both feel strongly in that regard. Thank both of you. We'll have to move on for the mm -hmm. essence of time. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is the Muni Golf Course in West Austin near Lake Austin Boulevard. I have a couple of questions. This community member wants to know, what plan does Senator Watson have for the Muni Golf Course? Why does he think property owners want to keep it? Why not let the users of the golf course pay to keep it? And why not let UT do what it wants to do with it? Senator Watson? There's a lot packed into that question. Yes. Um, well, let, let me tell you how I feel about Muni. Maybe that answers the whole question. And that is, I think that the first goal ought to be able to be, ought to be to preserve Muni. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons to want to do that. Uh, one is because uh, we're going to be looking for more green space and more parks uh, in the future, including as part of our climate plan. So that ought to, we ought to keep that into consideration. The second is historical. And I think that um, the fact that this was the first golf course that was uh, desegregated in the South uh, means something, and it ought to mean something to us. And so from a historical perspective, I think uh, we ought to look to do that. What that's going to mean, of course, is that we're going to have to figure out how we do that when you have, uh, when the city doesn't own it, and the city has a lease on it, and the lease is up. And so that's going to require uh, the ability to negotiate and have relationships uh, with the University of Texas at Austin and try to figure out unique ways that we might, the city might contribute uh, that, again, are equitable in the, way, in the way we go about that. Representative Israel? It's interesting, Sandra. I, um, the, the first time I rented in Austin, was on Lake Austin Boulevard. So I have a connection to this tract of land, not because, not because I golf. I mean, I golf really poorly every two years. Um, but um, there's so much potential for this part of Austin. And instead of having solutions in the eastern edge of the county or saying to our nurses, you have to move to Bastrop, this is part of my equity journey. Having uh, housing, uh, in and around this this area, it's going to take tenacity. And as I've said, every week in an Israel administration will be housing and affordability week. And it's personal to me because I used to rent a, a mobile home spot for 140 bucks a month and delivered pizzas and got my way through college that way. So I see potential, especially where I see so much open space. And because I have a reputation of being tenacious on this topic, I will make sure that we are working um, with 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 the University of Texas to, to think differently about that open space. There is so much potential for us to build workforce housing on those tracts of land. Thank if, you. If I might just quickly, there, the question was about Muni, which is the golf course. Um, the Brackenridge track is, is bigger than just the golf course. And the, the land that she mentions that she lived on, I'm, I'm confident, I don't know exactly where she lived, but I'm confident that it was south of Lakeshore, and that is uh, part of the Brackenridge Tract, which I do believe we ought to figure out how we can best develop that with the kind of density that provides a lot of affordable housing. And that's one of the things that I was talking about earlier about where affordable housing goes can make a difference. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our final question of the day. And that is about cycling. As we know in Austin, cycling is part of the culture from businesses for food deliveries to students heading to class or just leisure. So we have a question from a community member and he says, bike lanes were added to busy streets with safety posts like Westgate, making it look like an obstacle course or curbs added on slaughter making tighter lanes. What are your plans to update or add bike lanes on major streets? Representative Israel. I, I have heard from a lot of people on this topic, and they have opinions, and you're going to hear them. Um, we do need to make sure that cy our cyclists and pedestrians are, 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 are safe. We also need to make sure that we are not just, if we're going to re-engineer something, I trust traffic engineers, but I also want to double check because I know that there are instances where we have overbuilt or underbuilt for safety. Um, and. I've heard stories of people having 
uh, doing damage to their cars because of the way these things were designed. So we've got to we've got to be continually mindful of this. Um, when I have ridden my my bike as a young professional, and when we didn't have as many uh, infrastructure safety components built in, so we do want to encourage people to to say I can I can take the take a you know a, a two mile bike ride on a Sunday or on a Monday. I want them to have that option, but it means safety and it means having our traffic engineers revisit these for thoughtfulness. What they thought was going to work might not be the best thing, and we've got to retool it and, and make sure that we are we are being mindful of that. So I, I'm pleased that I was endorsed in, in this campaign by Bike Texas, and, and uh, in part because of the role I've played in the past, and they know I'll play in the future with regard to bike safety and making that a, a component of our transportation. Uh, but I agree that now that we've got some things in place, we ought to be listening to people that are uh, that are driving it and not turn it into, again, an all or nothing, winner take all uh, sort of discussion. Uh, if you talk to a number of Capital Metro bus drivers, one of the things that they'll tell you is that, that some of the, the sa bike safety lanes, uh, the, the, the stanchions are put in places that make it where it's unsafe for the bus to make certain types of turns. And, and those are the kinds of examples that it would make some sense to re-examine, see what you could do to hone in on what the problems are so that you have both. And then I'll just say something that probably is, is not the basis for uh, election, but it is we need to do something to make them prettier if we're going to have them. I mean, it, I, in my view, the, the difference it makes in our beautiful downtown <laughs> Uh, to have have certain types of ugly poles sticking up in the air, uh, you know, it's a small thing probably when you're talking about safety, but it's a big thing when you're talking about the beauty of our downtown and other parts of our city. It's especially important with Project Command. So that I've I've taken that number seven when I was a young professional, and when I got off the bus, I was I was that I won't curse. I was that young person who said, "Let me grab my bike," and and then I, you know a short a short bike ride. So. It's part of that connectedness to mass transit as well. I, I loved it. Well, thank both of you. Well, that concludes today's forum, but we're going to have our closing arguments. And we say arguments, but we hope that they'll keep them very civil and talk about what makes them the best candidate for mayor. Tell us why people should choose you, why you are the person that can lead the city, this rapidly growing city. You'll each have two minutes, and we'll begin with Senator Watson. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, again, thanks to everybody that put this on, and thanks for all that uh, have come here today, but also uh, those of you that are watching it either as it streams right now or you come back and watch it again. I appreciate the fact that you care enough about the mayor's race to, to be involved in that way. Um, I'm running because, let's face it, th there's a lot that's going on at City Hall where City Hall is not taking care of the basics. It's not focusing on fundamental things that we need to focus on. We've heard some of that uh, here today. And, and it, it frustrates us all. It puts us all in a situation where we, we know what a great place we have. We, we're optimistic about the future. We all have positive visions for it, but we're not taking care of the things that we need to take care of. I moved to Austin, Texas in 1981. I've been here a while now, and I love this city. I love the people of this city. But I worry because we're not taking care of basics that what's going to happen is we're going to lose a lot of the things that makes this place special. And I think a lot of them are at risk right now. So what I've been trying to do in this campaign is, is demonstrate not only a passion for getting those things done, but a recognition that we don't have any time to waste. We can't keep screwing around with some of this. We need someone in office that can address these issues in a way that has a real sense of immediacy to it, a real sense of urgency, and can get it done. I have asked the voters to please look and make a comparison between what has been done in the past, not because I want to just say I've done a lot of good things in the past. You know, when I got elected mayor, there were only four places, three, maybe four, you could live in downtown Austin. And I said, we're going to get more housing in downtown Austin. 
and we did. I said we could set aside a water supply for decades, and we did. I said we could end the war between environmentalists and developers, and not only did we do it, but we preserved all that land. In the Senate, I said we can make a difference when it comes to sexual assault on young girls on college campuses, and we did. We can modernize the Public Information Act, and we can get a medical school. I say that not to just point to those, but to demonstrate that I can get the things done that we need to get done and quickly. Thank you. So, so I much. ask for your vote. Thank you, Senator Watson. When when I came when I came here in 1982, I could not have imagined that I would have been in this position. Um, as a Latina, as a member of the LGBT community, um, I knew that there was a spirit of Austin that would welcome me. And I have put forth policies that speak to, to, to the inequities um, that I see from my lens. And for far too long, this city has become comfortable with pushing people out instead of inviting them in. That's why I'm running. I don't, I don't, I have been a very good member of the Texas House of Representatives. I have been a fighter, whether you're a woman, trans kid, immigrant, um, state employee, I have been there to fight for you. And I want to fight for the city of Austin. I wasn't feeling a sense of urgency from the city of Austin for the working men and women who are driving this economy, but who are getting pushed out. We can't just shrug our shoulders and say, okay, well, let's just, let's just stick with the status quo. We've got to move boldly, we've got to move forward, and we've got to move forward with urgency. I'm not doing this for me. I'm not doing this for a title. I'm trying to create a movement around housing and affordability so that when I take that gavel in January, I will be held accountable to say to the nurse and the teacher and the bus driver, you belong here in the heart of the city. This is, we're losing our diversity. We're losing our economic muscle. It's not sustainable to expect that line chef at the W to, to make our fancy omelet and then go home at night to Bastrop. It's not sustainable to our economy. So I ask for your vote. Give me an opportunity to lead a 10-member council. Those 10 members deserve to be heard and listened to. Let's move forward with urgency and let's move forward together. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that brings us to a close of ATS Decides Austin's next mayor, Representative Israel and Senator Watson. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Here are some important dates to remember for this election. Austin residents can vote early in person up until December 9th, and the runoff election is Tuesday, December 13th. I'd also like to thank our sign language interpreters, Sarah Carmony and Sean Whitley, for being with us today. And please remember that your voice and vote matter. At Austin PBS, we take pride in informing the community about issues of importance. We hope that this debate will help you make that decision on voting day. For Austin PBS, I'm Santa Henderson. Thank you. Thank you. Funding for ATX Decides is provided by AARP Austin.